Welcome again. This is uh, I am redoing the introductory video to the Gamma Central because the previous video had lots of flickering, so I'm using a different uh, software to record the session. So hopefully this time it will go better. So the Gamma Central tool is a tool that contains lots of interesting information from options about a particular underlying. You can do very advanced and sophisticated analysis with a very simple tool. So it's a tool that I love it. I, I really love it. I use it on my own. So I am glad that uh, I decided to create this web app so it's easier for me to have everything in a single place. So how the, how the Gamma Central tool looks like? This is how it looks like. It's a very simple tool. Uh, it only, the interface is kind of gets simpler than this. You select an underlying and just click on go and that's it. So let's look at GDX, a favorite of our fellow EWT uh, traders. So once you hit, you click on go, you will see uh, a volatility page. So I have different pages, volatility, open interest and volume. And I'm going to explain them in, um, not in order. I'm going to start by by the volume. Let's start by this one. This one is, is an easy one to start. So this is real time information and it's showing you the option volume uh, for the particular underlying. So this is in, this is in the case of GDX. The, all of the units for volume is in contracts and in thousands of contracts. So you can see, for instance, the, the most active option so far is early in the morning right now. So the most active um, options so far just with 18 minutes into the session are calls for July 21st, yeah, almost 11,000 contracts. So that's, a, that's an interesting piece of information. So you can see in this chart, you can see the volume uh, by different expiration dates. And you can see what is the most active expiration date. And you can see also really quickly if calls or puts are equally active or more active. In the case of something like GDX, clearly calls are dominating trading right now. It is it, it is um, an underlying that doesn't see that much option activity during the day. Like 10,000 contracts, 11,000 contracts is not really, it's not really a lot uh, in the big scale of things, but uh, for GDX it's a lot. Now you can see this one is a better, it's a better looking diagram because this one is by a strike. So, okay, so we have all those bunch of calls. So what is strikes are people trading and you can see that the most traded uh, is, uh, strike today is the 21.5 um, in GDX and followed by the 22.5 and there is some trading also on the 25. So this is this, these two charts give you a, a great view of what is happening in real time. And, and then you can also see by expiration. So let's, let's focus only because we know that the most active expiration is the July 21st. We can kind of go there and zoom in and we'll see that. So this call activity is basically in these two strikes, 21.5 and 22.5. And there is no, no much action going on right now. Uh, we could see something else. Let's look at uh, the SPX, which is actually heavily traded. <laughs> this is a heavily traded underlying, probably the most heavily traded of all in terms of notional value. And you can see the, the, the difference. Uh, no, you can see, well, in contracts, is the most heavy, it's only 8,000 contracts so far, but remember that a contract for XPS has a gigantic notional value versus something like GDX. Uh, so you can see a kind of a more active uh, profile and different expirations, like near term, like today. Today, there is, there is an activity for today. And also for the 21st, there is activity in the 21st, and as usual, puts in XPX dominate trading, uh, lots of puts and um, that's kind of normal. Don't, don't get scared in index options, puts are the ones that are traded. As you can see here, this shows you overall across every single expiration what is being traded and you can see the profile puts always tend to dominate. So let's try, you, know, you use the slider, you kind of uh, filter and you kind of zoom in into certain areas and and you can see uh, in a better way. You can act actually also slide these and it will slide. So it's just a nice uh, control I implemented for fun. Um, so we can see that there are puts at um, 
2250 that's kind of <laughs> they are really far away from here like 200 points down and there are plenty of puts um puts around 2400 and then only a few calls calls at 2430 and 2450 for reference the market is trading around 2425 right now so you can see more or less uh, the activity on index options. Let's look at SPY, which should mirror SPX, but is used by a different type of crowd. So XPX is a more institutional, um, so it's used by institutions and professionals. So SPY is used more by retail and and also professionals, but in a different way. So they are different options. They, they basically are options for the same. And you can see the patterns are different. You can see the patterns for for SPY are more near term as usual because retail people tend to trade uh, in, in short term intervals and also you can see SPY the puts don't you know even though they, they dominate around around the money they don't dominate across all the strikes so it's a, it's a more speculative uh, type of thing the ETF with different use patterns and you can see it's very I guess if you are really good at this, you could devise some clever strategies to exploit differences between the two. But uh, uh, I got that question in the room actually. But um, it's hard to, they, they are hard to exploit. The, the differences between XPY and XPX they are hard to exploit because in theory, um, one XPX option should be equivalent to 10 SPY options. And you could kind of like, with that, create some kind of arbitrage opportunity that equivalence is not being respected but it's hard but at least it gives you an idea of where the activity is happening right now in real time this is volume uh, this is real time volume that is being extracted from from the market um, and and this is only the volume tab so the volume tab gives you really good information remember you can uh, filtered by dates and you can see for instance the most active let's say for the 12th which is Wednesday so this is the activity for Wednesday the f usually puts always dominate the 240 put is the one that is dominating right now uh, for Wednesday and for Friday uh, for this Friday then you see this 230 put I will bet that people are just selling it you know <laughs> the, uh, unless you have lots of pessimistic people here uh, making a gigantic bet and that well it's not gigantic it's only 2,000 contracts remember that these the units are on the thousand so either someone is spending two thousand uh, dollars two thousand contracts I mean uh, that the market is going to drop more than a hundred points from here to Friday or they are just selling these and collecting premium from here to Friday it is more likely in something like SPY that premium is being sold right now so this is the volume tab. Let's look at the open interest tab. This is the open interest. So open interest is different to volume. Open interest is only updated once a day. Uh, there is no real time open interest. I know that's kind of a bummer. I, I would love to have that information, but uh, um, even though we are in the 21st century, uh, we don't have real time open interest from CBOE. And I guess the reason is because this comes from the OCC, the Options Clearing Corporation, and I guess the way they compute open interest, they are very, very specific about it, very rigid about it, and the contract has to be settled. You now there has to be like a full settlement for the contract, uh, because orders could be cancelled, and you know people can walk away from the order. So, so open interest, they they really want to be very very specific very particular about it uh, so this thing is only published once a day it's only published uh, officially uh, late night uh, after the session is is gone and sometimes even three in the morning you know? so but anyway even though it is not real time uh, because it's the total open interest is very helpful you can see that now that is massive interest I mean we're talking about millions of contracts it's only almost three million contracts right here and you can see where the open interest lies for something like SPY you know it's like July 21st this is very common the the official monthly expirations are the ones that see massive open interest but in in SPY 
uh, open interest is focused on the near term. So this is July is the one that has the massive open interest. And you can see that, again, puts dominate calls and puts us 3 million contracts versus 1.5 million contracts. And you can see how puts dominate the whole thing across every possible strike. Puts is, is, is an index thing. Um, it is the structure of the market is very structural. This is, this is what happens with, uh, uh, with options that track an index. If we look at SPX, SPX is different in terms of uh, open interest. The profile of SPX is, is very different because this is like the professional thing. So massive open interest is, uh, is concentrated around quarters. So you will see, for instance, September 29th, which is the end of the quarter, is the one that has massive open interest. And the open interest in SPX is gigantic compared to SPY. So in terms of contracts, it's only... 1.4 million contracts, but remember that each contract in XPX is basically 10 contracts in SPY. So this is like in SPY terms, this is this is the equivalent notional of 14 million uh, SPY contracts versus three. So so in terms of is in notionally based, this is, this is a heavily traded uh, product. This is a product that has more open interest uh, in terms of notional value that is more like a uh, raw dollars <laughs> riding in SPX options than in SPY. Um, but it's, yeah, and also it's a different behavior, different crowd. Notice how the end of the quarter is, is gigantic. And also, of course, the the, the classic uh, monthly one, July 21st, is, is very is heavily active and um, December too. So, so SPY is, is a different thing. But but again, puts are are dominate, and if you have a really good eye, and I don't know the quality of the video, you can see something that that only happens in XPX, and lately is happening also on future options for the ES Mini. I just this is just for fun. This is not important at all. But I, I don't know. If you notice how this is plenty of puts, but here there are some calls. And a lot of calls, like a hundred thousand of them, and here, so, so those strikes are really low, like the one thousand strike. Why would you buy uh, calls strike at one thousand? And this is the two thousand strike. So this is something really cool for you option nerds there, that you can actually see in person what is called a box trade. This is a box trade. And it happens between the 1,000 and the 2,000 uh, strike. So it's a, it's a trade. It, this is a spread that is 1,000 uh, points apart. And it's basically a synthetic short and a synthetic long. Uh, I don't know exactly because I don't know uh, the trade. So I don't know if this is the short and this is the long or vice versa. But the idea um, when you do these kind of trades is that you sell, you create a synthetic short of XPX at 1,000 and a synthetic long at 2,000 by using calls and puts, you not know, like straddle uses basically, like a like a chart. I mean, you, you sell calls and buy puts or uh, buy calls and sell puts. So basically, your position is completely neutral. You are not exposed to anything on the market. If the market goes up and down, your position doesn't change value at all. If the box is one of the most useless positions ever in the universe because it really doesn't do anything. However, in index, a box does something very interesting because it is a way to express a position on interest rates. The only, the only Greek letter that affects a box is called rho. The, the, the Greek parameter rho, which is no one uses it, but rho is used for interest rates. So right here, this position, which is gigantic, you now it is lots of 90,000 calls and um, probably 90,000 calls, 90,000 puts, 90,000 calls, 90,000 puts, or something like that. Those kind of uh, boxes are used as a way to borrow money. You know, it's, it's something interesting. I, well, I'm using this video about this tool just to talk about this position. So right here, this transaction is basically someone is borrowing money from someone else. So whoever is writing the box is the lender and whoever is buying the box is the borrower. And why would you do that? Because yeah, right, it's easier than going to a bank 
and as for a loan, you just create the <laughs> box position and and that's it. And that's how it works. And and when it expires, the only thing that exchange is the only thing that is exchanging hands at the end of the transaction is a, is an interest rate differential. And it's a very interesting position and it's, it's done professionally and it's only done on SPX options. You won't see a box ever on SPY options. And lately you are seeing it on on you're kind of seeing these trades on ES future options, but it's only because CME changed the they changed the options from American expiration to European expiration. So this is only something that can be do, done with European uh, kind of options. Anyway, sorry about that. I was digressing here, but I really wanted to show you the box. And you will see that this box is a very popular trade, and I bet it's present across every single expiration, probably July 21, and you see the box in July 21, you see here the calls, and I bet that it's also on September, no, September 29. It's, it's a systematic kind of trade. Uh, right here, there is the 1,000, and here is the 2,000. And you will see it across all expirations. So, so people just keep uh, borrowing money like that, and you know, like in, in the most liquid expirations, you will see them very liquid. You, I don't think you will see this in a, in a weekly, like the, the one for next week, you don't see it, it's not there. So no one will use a box on weekly expirations. They use only use the most liquid ones. So this is kind of the open interest for SPX. Uh, for volume, and you will notice that volume is July 24. I guess I already talked about volume here. So what else can I show from this tool? So the tool, well, okay, the tool provides really very interesting information. Let's move into like a momentum stocks. Let's, let's look something like a Tesla, just to see for fun how this profile looks. So it's very the Tesla. The, when you have momentum stocks, momentum stocks are very different breed than index options and anything else. So open interest usually is focused really far away. So in this case is six months out for January is the, the has the is the expiration that has the most, most interest and um, puts dominate. Um, hard to tell it puts dominate because people are being bearish or just people were selling lots of puts. Uh, this is impossible to tell. There's things you won't be able to tell from these charts. But you can tell that that's kind of the most uh, the most interest is right there. You don't see interest at all in the middle. And in the near term, there is some interest you now for this week and next week, but nothing like long term. However, uh, so, so this open interest kind of shows you positioning by big institutions. But when you look at volume, volume is really funny with uh, with with fangs, with, with momentum stocks. It's all near term. So all of the trading volume, as you can see, is, is only half an hour after the open. Look, all of the volume is basically, most of the volume is focused on the weekly options. Everyone and their mother is trading weekly options for <laughs> for momentum stocks, and that's how it works. And, and then there is some volume on the 21st, but it is like it is like this, and I bet if I switch to Amazon, it will be a very similar profile. Anything that smells like momentum will have volume that is really focused near time. Look at this in Amazon. This is basically all of the trading is happening for this Friday, and just a few crumbs later on. So this is a retail activity. Retailers love this. I mean, retail traders are the only ones that trade on these intervals. Why would you trade <laughs> with something that has only four days on, on it? No, there is no institutional trading. Uh, in terms of uh, activity, I guess the depends on the stock. Uh, look at Amazon. Amazon tends to, to have very lots of calls, I guess, everyone. Um, if we assume that those calls are being bought, then you know, people are betting on more ups upside for Amazon. So momentum stocks, will you you can kind of tell the momentum right here. The momentum seems to be up for Amazon. And let's go back to Tesla and see where the momentum is taking Tesla. And Tesla, you know, there is some puts that are dominating heavily. So there is, uh, again, I'm not claiming that people are bearish because I, I don't know exactly if these things are being um, bought or sold. It's something that I could add later on, some kind of algorithm to guess. But um, in general, let's assume, that because it's mostly retail traders, uh, let's assume that, that those are being bought. So 
Uh, yeah, as you can see, the momentum kind of flips back and forth depending on the stock that you are using. Like, let's use, use Google Class A and see what Google. And then Google is slightly different. Google does have the retail trading here, uh, but I also have a little weird bit more towards the end of the month. So you can, but this is, I bet this is related to something else. Uh, and I, I will use the other tab to show you what this is related. And you can also kind of tell the momentum here. Momentum seems to be favoring calls, uh, lots of calls. Today, today is, is very early in the session, but this is what it's looking like uh, right now. So this is volume, uh, the open interest. And again, you can filter by different expirations. You can play with the strikes. You can do all those all those interesting things you want to use. But then let's look at this very cool um, volatility page. This is where, where the magic really happens here. So I'm going to talk about, let's, in the original video, I started with the variance or X premium. Let's start with the term structure first. So what is a term structure chart? A term structure chart is a chart of implied volatilities of options uh, on the y-axis versus the time to expiration on the y in the x-axis in days. So this is the volatility of options that expire in four days from now, 11 days from now, 18, and so forth and so on. Now you have these options that expire 700 days away. So a term structure tells you an idea of implied volatility expectations, of, of, of volatility expectations in general uh, measured by implied volatility. Uh, how is this implied volatility computed? I mean, this is a single number, uh, but we have hundreds of options for Google uh, and every option has a different implied volatility value. Well, so this this measurement here is extracted use, using the, the same methodology that is used for VIX, the VIX. So the CBOE, the Chicago Board of, uh, I don't know what is the E. <laughs> Uh, CBOE. Well, I don't know. Oh, Chicago Board of Options Exchange. That's what it is. Now I remember. Sorry about that. It's early in the morning for me. My brain is still uh, woken up right now. So CBOE defines a methodology to compute VIX. And VIX is basically the implied variance. Uh, it's a mathematical formula that gives you the implied variance from option prices. And the beauty of something like that computation is, is that you don't have to use any model for option prices. I mean, the model doesn't care if you're using black shawls or you're using a stochastic volatility or local volatility or, or any kind of weird mathematical model. No, the, this uses a fundamental insights into option pricing and and the insight is that option prices at the end of the day reflect expectations of the terminal distribution. And from that, the terminal dis probabilistic, uh, probabilistic clear distribution. So from, from that, you can compute the implied variance of that distribution, which is in tremendously useful. And if you remember, volatility is used the standard deviation. So it's just the square root of that implied variance. So um, that's how I compute um, the implied volatility. Uh, and I guess this, this you won't be able to see this on any platform because I don't think any retail platform uses VIX as the value for implied volatility. Most, all of retail platform does is they always use the add the money volatility, the volatility of the add the money options, which is useless. The volatility of the add the money options are completely, is used completely useless because it is not giving you an idea of what is happening with the puts that are far away of the money. There could be heavy put activity far from from where the current level is, like probably people are really, really pessimistic about the stock. And yet the other money volatility is kind of low, but because all of the activity is happening far away. So when you use something like the methodology for VIX, it captures all those things. So this that's what I like. Uh, so coming back to the term structure, sorry about that. Uh, the term structure of Google, for instance, is very interesting. This is not how a normal term structure should like. This is completely, this is not at all. Uh, look at how it looks like. How it should it look like? Let, let me show you how, how, how a new term structure should look like. Let's look at the index one. Let's look at SPX. Uh, sorry that I'm switching back and forth so much. This is how it should look like. It should look like, like something that is smoothly going up and it kind of goes up. This is a normal, 
Carmen structure. And why it should look like this? Because implied volatility is just a reflection of uncertainty. So it turns out that if, if something like options are going to expire just a few days from now, in 14 days, there's a certain level of level of uncertainty about the underlying so i guess i price them at that level as options get farther and farther away from from today i mean 400 days away 500 days away the uncertainty is higher and higher so i have to price the options more expensive because i don't know what is going to happen so the option pricing and by extension implied volatility goes higher because we don't know what can happen you know the unknowns in the market and this is this is how a term structure should look like. This is what is called contango. In, con the, in contango regime is where um, near-term values are lower than farther out values. This is using, a fancy name uh, that comes from the futures <laughs> industry, but I am using it here for options. So this is how it should look like. Yet Google doesn't look like this. Yet Google looks completely the opposite. Like with the exception of these two, the four and the eleven days, everything is. It seems the uncertainty is high, uh, highest, uh, eighteen days from from now, and kind of is dropping and dropping, and then kind of flats out. Like how this could be, and this is an exercise for you, the viewer. Uh, just take into account that this video, I am recording this video on July ten. So I don't know if that clicks into your mind or not the date that the video is being recorded. Uh, and if you have guessed already, yes, this is basically the typical term structure you will see when an earnings report is about to hit the market. Clearly, Google is going to report earnings soon. So when? So it's going to report earnings around 18 days from now. So I don't even know. So I have no look. I, I am telling you, I never pay attention to individual stocks. So I have no idea when earnings uh, happen. But just from the term structure, I can tell that earnings are happening around this date. No, it has to be before the date. No. <laughs> so earnings are happening between 11 days and 18 days. It can happen at any place in between, you know. And when is the 18 uh, volatility? Is uh, July 28th. So it Earnings for Google uh, are happening between July 21st and July 28th. I don't know exactly. I, I, I bet if I look at it, I Google it, uh, it tells me the exact date. But I don't, I don't need it. I can see it here from the time structure. So, and then that's the explanation. What happens is that option dealers, because during earnings, and in particular during earnings of something like Google or Amazon or these kind of really heavy tech uh, companies, you, if I am an option dealer, if my if I make a living selling options to you guys, I, I for me uncertainty is hanging right here. This is the earnings release. I don't know what is going to happen. Sometimes these things can shoot up like a forty points up, forty points down. This thing can move like crazy. So uh, this is one of those cases when the uncertainty is now near term. Then. As time passes, if I'm selling options with 340 days, I, I really don't care. I mean, this particular earnings, uh, whatever is the big fluctuation that happens, is going to be kind of resolved by by in 340 days. So, so this implied volatility kind of stays the same. Uh, it goes up a little bit, but I, it's not as crazy as the near-term volatility. So the risk as an option dealer, my main risk is around this area, around earnings, and this you see this inversion. Uh, of of the term structure, so the term structure is inverted, and and you see the two features that I love from term structures like this: inversion of the term structure and then flatness. You no, know? so it, it kind of inverts, and then after that, I have no idea. I have no idea. So flatness means I have no idea what is going to happen. As an option dealer, I don't even pretend to know that is going to happen with this, and then that's why uh, it looks so flat. Once the earnings report goes away, this curve will go back to the previous one that I showed you, where near-term volatility is lower because nothing, I don't expect anything to happen, and then as uncertainty grows, implied volatility goes high. So the question is, oh, can I design a trade to exploit this kind of thing? And the answer is yes. Uh, you could design trades to exploit this this tremendous uh, differences in term structures and you can do plays only on the term structure so the beauty of those plays are they depend on the 
on the particular shape of the autonomous structure, not much, not so much on the price of the underlying. Uh, however, there are, of course, there are no such thing as free lunches. You always take a risk. You no, know? <laughs> every every position has a risk. When you when you play a directional position, the risk is that the thing moves in the wrong direction. When you play something in the time structure, then you are switching. You are you are swapping the risk for something else. You no, know? so if I play, for instance, the the right here from the top of the head, you don't have to be an option expert to to see that. Man, if I could sell this implied volatility at 32 and by this implied volatility at 23 and if after earnings the corp normalizes i will pocket that differences i will pocket probably nine volatility points of difference or more no and i and i will say to you yes you're right that's a great play this is a great play now the, the what is the risk the risk is that the curb doesn't come down that much uh, uh, that remains inverted, or the risk is that probably this one, f uh, even though the curve goes, goes back to normal, this volatility drops substantially more, and and then because options that are far away, options are more sensible to more sensitive to changes in implied volatility. The options that you bought here are going to lose more value than the ones that you bought here. So it, it, it contains, it's a puzzle with a lot of moving parts, but it is possible to design trades like that. Um, right now, as, 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 a, as a someone that has done this many times in the past, I was telling you that this is not enough for me. This is not attractive enough, even though it looks so nice and so juicy. 32%, this nine balls and, and at 32% are not that attractive. This is something, um, is not, in terms of raw dollars, it's not much. In terms of uh, volatility points, it looks a lot, but in terms of raw dollars, it's not a lot of money there. So uh, I will not be interested in trading something like this in Google. Let's look at Amazon and see how Amazon looks like. Exactly the same. <laughs> so oh, even you, and the values are very similar. That's so funny. Amazon. Then what, what conclusion do you do you get here? The same one. Amazon will report earnings between July twenty first and July twenty eighth. That, that's what a conclusion I get from this term structure. The earnings report. Uh, so far, it's not a crazy level, but I'm telling you, in something like Amazon, for instance, it's only 32%. But as the date approaches, you will see this peak going up and up and up and up. This is going to be interesting. This thing, I have seen this going to amazingly high values. Um, and then let's look at Tesla. I am so curious to know what is going on with Tesla because Tesla has all these near-term events. So I don't know. Oh, look at this. This is even, this is more interesting. Tesla, this chart doesn't even look like the other ones. Uh, look at this. For four days, which is Friday, is 60% implied volatility. This is going crazy. So a couple of things are happening. It looks like might be we might have earnings on Friday. I doubt it because then why these two points are lower than these two points? No, it should it should be like a nice inverted thing. So my guess is is that earnings are around here in the second peak. Um, the second peak is August fourth, so it's between the twenty eighth and, and the fourth is earnings, and this amazingly gigantic peak for Friday is just always to the peculiarity of whatever is going on with Tesla right now. So Tesla has been um, suffering from a massive fall all from the top, so you know, almost 20% from the top. So it's a bearish um, regime right now. It's a, it's a bear market regime and option dealers are just basically overpricing them. So if you play, so if you're playing options in Tesla that expire on this Friday, you know you are joining the ranks of people that loves to waste money. Why will you waste money? This, this remember that implied volatility comes from option prices. So this incredibly high, this is like beyond high. Sixty percent implied volatility means they are robbing you, right? And play on daylight, they are robbing you. They are charge, overcharging for options. So don't buy options for July 14. I mean, don't do it. Like if if your life depends on it, just refuse it. Come on, guys, don't do that. I know some of you will say, "Okay, so if they're robbing me, 
if they are overpricing the options for Friday, what about selling them? And then I will say to you, you know, at this level, at 60%, I might be interested in selling options uh, because I am a very greedy person. You, you know that you always assume risk and, and the risk of selling such a short dated options, only four days on them, is a gigantic risk. So you're assuming outrageous amount of risk because um, the gamma on those options for you, you know that I, I am a gamma I love it. the tool is called the gamma central the gamma on those options is crazy I mean the gamma if you remember my previous videos is is inversely proportional to the expiration so the shorter um, the time the option has the smaller that time the option has on it is the higher is gamma and for four days the gamma for options for four days is gigantic so I don't want to be huge amounts I don't want to be short huge huge amounts of gamma unless I am being compensated fairly so 60% volatility is kind of like right there on the fair compensation 100% volatility is more than fair you know anything that that goes around the 100% uh, volatility mark I will sell with my closed eyes but right now Tesla is not uh, it's not at that level uh, it's funny because there is one underlying Netflix is is consistently before earnings start approaching they are, look at this <laughs> uh, Netflix is approaching 70% volatility and it looks like the earnings release is going to happen between the 14 and the 21 so and look at this it's almost 70 so Netflix and this is a nice earnings release uh, term and structure uh, so yeah, Netflix is, is getting to the point where I might c come up with something. Now. I might come up with something to exploit uh, those differences because now the near term is, is uh, overpricing uh, at, you know, at levels that compensate the risk that you're taking. Anyway, so this is kind of, of the term structure thing. Um, then let's move to something else. I have spoken about the term structure for too long. Let's look at, about the volatility cone. So the volatility cone and the variance risk premium are basically the same thing uh, in different time scales. So mm, the question is, how do I know if options are cheap or are expensive? That's, the, that's kind of the question. No? Do we have expensive options or do we have cheap options right now? Uh, it's impossible to tell. I mean, the price of an option doesn't really tell you if the option is expensive or cheap. But if you use something like the volatility cone, you can give, give, get a great idea if options are cheap or not. So the volatility cone is used showing you realized volatility for the past seven years, but group in little buckets. So the buckets, the thing is being grouped. It's okay, so what is the statistical values of uh, realized volatility for 360 days? So you can say, okay, the max value has been almost 80%. The mean value 30% and with a mean uh, volatility of 52%. No, uh, so you can tell that Netflix is a beast. <laughs> even even in one year, Netflix can move all the way from 30 to almost 80 with a 52% mean. And then there is another bucket for 330, and you notice that of course as the bucket becomes smaller, the volatility becomes higher because the underlying can be more active I, I mean in one week you can have tremendous variations lots of um, variance lots of volatility but in the longer term you know, it tends to, tends to be very stable and this is what the volatility con is showing you the stability one year out and craziness uh, on shorter periods for instance in seven days for uh, we have seen Netflix move around 323 percent and six percent. So Netflix is a beast. I'm using the wrong, <laughs> the wrong underlying to use the volatility con because Netflix is, is is something that is crazy. This thing is is super crazy, but it's good. It's good to see a volatility con for crazy underlines. Uh, but because the features are the same, no matter what underlying you you are seeing, you you see kind of the expected volatility for the time period. You can see the mean volatility in red. And finally, you can see options in black. So 
this this graph is interesting. It shows you how, for instance, near-term options seem to be overpriced with respect to the mean. Their price is substantially higher, and this is what is showing right here. And you can tell that the reason is earnings. That's one of the reasons. But at the same time, we can see that options are priced below the mean for longer times. Include, in fact, look at this one. This option at 340 days is priced at 33.7 IV, and it's very close to the mean value that we have experienced. So this is a very cheap option for Netflix, the, the, the one right here, which is the last one. I think it's 340 days from now, it's one year from now. So it's probably this one right here. So this is a very fairly priced option very decently priced options for uh, June 15 in 2018. So that's what the volatility coin is telling you. It's telling you how the options are priced based on historical volatility for the past seven years. And, and that's very useful. Let's look at something that is more sane. Let's look for something like Goldman Sachs. Something that, that is not that crazy. So look at Goldman Sachs. Oh, Goldman Sachs is also reporting earnings. And so the good thing is we can tell that earnings season is open us <laughs> based on the on the t on the term structures and you can also see the best trades uh, so if i am going to trade goldman sachs i will trade i will sell volatility for uh, july 21st and i will buy volatility for september 15 because you know because after earnings this thing is going to stay nice in contango so I, this is the like really cheap options here so you sell expensive options buy expensive options anyway um, the volatility con is more decent it's not that crazy uh, and the longer term is more stable too and you can see also that options in this case are little overpriced and because of earnings they are super overpriced in this area uh, let's look at GDX uh, which is the favorite, the crowd favorite. GX, okay, because it's, a, it's, it's something about metals, don't even look at the term structure. Term structure for things uh, related to precious metals so is it's crazy all the time. Yeah, Sometimes you get, it's kind of in contango, but you get some spikes uh, based on near term action. But at least the volatility cone is way more stable. And you can see that in general, GX options are underpriced when compared to the mean. Uh, and what does it mean? The, what it means is really that uh, the prices of options, contrary to popular belief, are not really set by supply and demand. Options are a derivative, so the price of options is really tied to the underlying, but something that I'm going to tell you, the price of options is basically set by option dealers. Uh, that's, that's what it is. Option dealers are tell you this is what the option is. Sometimes the market will kind of like is they are priced. Uh, how is what is the correct expression? I guess they are priced a uh, uh, such a way to that is the maximum pain for the buyer. No, <laughs> they 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 price the options at levels that uh, if they raise the price a little higher, then no one will buy them because they will cry full. So they kind of lower the price enough so you buy them. Uh, and and so, but the price of options is really is really dictated by option dealers. Period. There is no supply of demand. It's like I have a lot of people buying options, or I don't have people buying options. No, it's just as a, me as an option dealer. I say this is the level I want to sell the options. So the cons this is the consensus. The black line is a consensus of option dealers. How option dealers are seeing these things, and. Option dealers, in the case of GDX, are pricing the options consistently under the historical mean. So uh, they are not losing money. No, no option dealer will lose money. So they are not selling cheap just because they want to uh, entice you to buy them. They are selling cheap is because they are not expecting GDX to be as volatile as it has been in the past. This is what it really means. Is the expectations of future volatility for GDX are lower than the historical expectation, the historical realized volatility for the last seven years. And this is the volatility con. Very useful to see expectations, um, very useful uh, to see if options are underpriced or overpriced uh, for a period of time. And finally, we have the variance risk premium. Almost, <laughs> we almost, uh, I almost forgot about it. And uh, we're arriving to this thing. The variance risk premium is 
is the same that the volatility come. The difference is is only for for a recent volatility. So look at this. The option, the farther away option is uh, January nineteen. Uh, January 18, 2019. So this is probably like one year and a half from now. Uh, so so this only covers 18 months. So and what it is is the same thing. Is I'm comparing the implied volatility of every option line through the VIX column with the realized volatility for the same period. So this option is only four days away. So this is the realized volatility of the last four trading days. So, and the VRP is just a percentage of overpricing or underpricing. So it means that options for this Friday in GDX are almost 36% overpriced with respect to very recent historical volatility. This is only four days. And if, you, if I go a little farther, for instance, I go to like August 11. So this is one month out. So this is the implied volatility of those options, 30%, almost 30 and a half percent. And realized volatility uh, in the past month has only been 22.58%. So this is almost 35% overpricing. So the VRP gives you an idea of the overpricing of options with respect to very recent volatility. You can see how near term seems to be kind of overpriced, but then the overpricing is coming down. And you can see, for instance, here it switches negative, which is uh, it means that, for instance, for June 15, 2018, I told you they were really cheap. <laughs> um, those options are really decently priced. And and the VRP is negative, it's minus 12%. They are 12% cheaper than the realized volatility. The, there are reasons for that. There are, uh, the reasons is that probably option dealers are not seeing that much volatility in the future, but for the equivalent period, which al is almost one year out, um, for one year out, these options, uh, we have seen in GDX a volatility, a realized volatility it has happened at 38.35. So, but the options are only charging you 33. They are giving you a discount, and one of the reasons they are giving you a discount is not because they are nice um, and they want to give you money. They are giving you a discount is just because they don't expect GDX to be as volatile as it has been in the past one year. So you, that, that you have it, the variance risk premium table is also very useful uh, to pick uh, dates that are expensive or cheap like why would you pick an expensive date as for instance this one in august 4 uh, this is incredibly expensive if, if yeah, a vrp is 42 percent and the risk then why would you do this uh, why would you pick this one well if you are in the business of selling options then sell the ones that are overpriced no so the table has a has a team for a uh, for each um kind of trader. Now for option buyers you tend to stick with the look for cheap uh, variance risk premium lines but for option sellers look for expensive ones. Now that's how you will do it. So there you have it. This is the little gamma central. This is a work in progress. I am adding today July 10 I add in an earnings tab. Now that I have seen that pretty much everything is coming into earnings soon then let's do that. I have an earnings module that it will, you know, right away I can tell you, it's not that it's going to predict what is going to happen in earnings. It's impossible to predict earnings. If you want to predict what will happen after earnings, just take a coin and flip it. It is, you will have exactly the same odds than anyone else in the market. No one can predict what will happen. However, you can have lots of interesting information about earnings. You can see, uh, for instance, in the case of Amazon, these options are being priced around 32% volatility. That pricing might give you an idea about the expectations that option dealers have about how Amazon is going to move after earnings. So knowing that expectation from option dealers is very helpful because option dealers are really smart. However, for earnings, even that can trip you off sometimes. No, so option dealers are really smart. They, they will never lose money. Most of the time, they will never lose money. Those guys use really good software and good mathematical models, and they have all this statistical information. Those guys are not in the business of losing money. 
However, around earnings, there is a combination of things. There is option dealers <laughs> pricing the options and lots of retail people trying to play it. Uh, as you can see, and retail people are really short-term focused kind of people, as you can see by volume here. Then therefore, there is a combination of of currents for earnings. So the volatility that you see the, here is a combination of what the option dealers are seeing plus what retail traders are bumping to. Like, I mean, if I am an option dealer and it starts selling options at 10 bucks, but people are paying 11, then I'll bump the price to 11, even though my mathematical models tell me that 10 is more than enough. Why will I sell the option cheap if I have lots of retail, lots of people coming to pay 11? And if they pay 12, fine, I'll sell you 12. You know, if you want me to, to sell you options at 12, I'll sell you. So sometimes the volatility you see here is being bumped a little bit by, um, by retailers, so you will never see underpricing because of retailers. If I, my models are telling me that I should sell the option at 10 bucks, but retail is only paying nine, too bad. I am not going to sell you the option at nine. <laughs> so there are, I, I rather don't sell anything. So, 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 so the option dealers put a floor to imply volatility and retail uh, usually is very good at raising that level from the floor, uh, in particular around earnings. So earnings is a, is a tricky thing, but so I'm going to add an earnings tab that will give you lots of interesting information. So, but in the meantime, this is, this is a tool. There's, there's a volatility tab with the variance risk premium, term structure, volatility con. I hope you have seen how to use them. There is a tab for uh, open interest of options. Uh, it gives you interesting insight into the thing. And there is a tab about volume that shows you that is real time. It's only for the day. And in fact, the information is kind of erased after 8 p.m. or something with Opera kind of resets the volume information. So. I hope you have fun with the tool, uh, play with it, and please report any bugs that you find. I will appreciate this. It's very new, it's under development, so uh, any feedback is greatly appreciated. Thank you.